Hello everyone, Dan Swift here, founder and CEO at Numentum, and welcome to the speaker series where we spotlight some of the most interesting minds in the world of revenue generation. At Numentum, we help forward-thinking B2B organizations create better buyer experiences and deliver new momentum to their revenue engine. On this episode of the speaker series, we speak with Pat McCarthy, Chief Revenue Officer at Precisely. We have a great conversation around evolving leadership styles, modern selling as digital selling, and getting a little bit better each time. Well, let's jump straight in. So I introduce you as the, the Chief Revenue Officer at Precisely. And for those of you um, listening to today's call, Pat, you've been there about three months. Is that about right? Uh, 108 days today. <laughs> Fantastic. So for our listeners, for, 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 for context, would you mind sharing just a little bit about Precisely and what is it that you're solving for your customers? Sure. Uh, Precisely is a data integrity company, meaning we focus on producing data and content that is very relevant, uh, contextually aware, and uh, very accurate. And so we help companies extract data, enrich that data, normalize that data, govern that data. And um, data is the new oil that's been around for a long time. But this idea of enriching my data and enriching my content um, for informed decision making so that you can trust in data. Our tagline underneath precisely is trust in data. And uh, the reason that that has risen in importance is, you know, we have machines now making decisions. And so training the machines properly and feeding the machines correct data, digital transformation uh, and kind of what we experienced during COVID uh, has really changed things. You know, before you used to have a good at a store that was sitting in one spot and a person mm. would travel to that. Now both of those are in motion. Like the person is moving and the good is moving simultaneously. And so both of those things being in motion has really increased the requirement for um, better definition and better accuracy and better insights around data. And then just the, you know, rising awareness and concerns around ESG topics or UN SDG topics. Um, climate change, awareness, uh, supply chain disruption, uh, appropriate sourcing, those, all of those ideas are found, founded in having rich, robust, strong, well-curated data and content and information. And so we, um, take it, we really feel like we've created a unique market niche on this data integrity and trust in data. Uh, and um, it's proving to be very, very well received by our clients. Amazing. And now you are a data guy, as I know, so 108 days um, in the seat. How has it been? It's been really good. It was, uh, you know, during the due diligence process for me, uh, it was most important that I work for somebody that I can learn from. And so Josh Rogers, our CEO, is an incredibly bright guy, um, really great to work with. And this is, we're a PE-backed firm, so this is a, a new operating environment for me. So I'm learning a lot in, uh, in that regard. And then the, the business is in really is in pretty good shape. Um, so the you know has really been tweaking and tuning uh, processes and the capabilities of the business. Um, but it's a strong group of individual contributors coming from an amalgamation of companies. You know we've grown um, uh, significantly through acquisition, and so we're blending a lot of cultures, blending a lot of processes, and blending a lot of people into who precisely is today. So it's been it's been really exciting. You were in our Chief Revenue Officer report last year, and you said, and I'm going to quote here, you said, in relation to the role of the CRO, and I thought this was fantastic, the requirements to be knowledgeable about the business end-to-end -end is a quantum leap from someone who is running a region or, responsibly, or responsible primarily for a booking or a sales number. And it really um, resonated with us at Empire because I don't think, we don't think people really understand just how much is involved with being a true CRO, not just with title, but a true CRO. So can you tell us a little bit about that quote and, and, and why you, you shared that? Well, I mean, um, in, my, in my sales career, I had primarily been responsible for delivering a revenue target or a bookings number, ACV mm -hmm. or a perpetual license. And um, I think when you start talking about revenue, it's 
it's not just the top line, it's what's being returned to the bottom line. And so the decisions that you make are not just about growing the top line, um, operating income or EBITDA or efficiency of the organization is quite different. And so in my prior sales leadership roles, I didn't pay attention to kind of cost roll-up structures of our cloud mm. infrastructure. I didn't necessarily pay as much attention to kind of buff maintenance renewal rates or maintenance increases on an ongoing basis. Um, I may not have looked at the services business that we had and looking at things like attach rates or margins related to the service in the context of the overall deal. And so now I pay attention to all of those things and I'm far more familiar with the line item at the line item level in our PL on the different levers I have to pull for product and packaging, for go-to-market initiatives, for where we spend money and how the money that we spend in pursuit of mm -hmm. clients it matriculates into top line and bottom line growth. Those are valued differently, like operating income is valued differently than top line revenue growth. Um, ARR is valued differently than EBITDA, but all of those in context of each other, having an understanding and being in full alignment with the CFO about where we make investments with the CMO about how we invest dollars that we have available to us is, I would say, materially different than my role or my function for running some pretty large businesses where I really only had the bookings target. So yeah, and, and, let, and let's talk about those booking uh, those um, previous roles, right? Because you spent 15 years with SAP, uh, and that's actually where we obviously met. And um, before joining RMS as the CRO, um, which ultimately got acquired by Moody's Analytics, so you brought Empire into both SAP and into RMS, two yeah. very very different companies. So can you share with our listeners? why you've been so keen to empower the teams that you've been responsible for at these two very different companies in, in the way that we've done. Yeah, I think I, you know, I've, uh, you and I have spoken about this. To me, modern selling has a massive digital component to it. Like there is, mm -hmm. people talk about digital sales. To me, that is modern sales. Modern sales has a digital component to it. And so understanding um, how do you raise awareness uh, of your client about what your solution offering is? How do you increase the relevance of the product brand or the company brand, but also your personal brand. How do you leverage a network for your ability to influence or to um, penetrate um, accounts or get meetings with people um, by using the positive brand that you've created with other clients? All of those things are modern selling uh, techniques and digital aspects of that enable that at some level of scale. And so it's um, you know, for, for, for both of those scenarios, it was how do you advance the profession of being a professional seller uh, and you use digital to do that, um, to help drive that at scale. So that's what, that's, it was obvious at SAP and it was obvious at, uh, at RMS that that was the continuation of the journey that we're on um, with both of those selling forces. And, and a lot of what we do now is helping sales organizations who are working from home or kind of part working from home, hybrid kind of roles, um, adjust to that, that environment. So yes, I want to talk about how you've helped sales organizations, but I also want to learn a little bit about what you've learned about yourself personally and professionally during the last two years. Can you, can you touch on that a little bit for us? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, was quite, it was quite a shock. I, I was in 21 countries in 2019 and I've been in one country in uh, 20 and 21 and so far mm. in 22. So it was a pretty big difference. And, and, and while some of that was internal focused, a lot of it was uh, seeing clients. And so I liked to um, see clients and engage with clients um, in person. And mm -hmm. the, so the negative for me is not being able to do that um, and to do that and get the, I got a lot of personal satisfaction out of that. Mm. The positive has been, I think access has increased. The, the, the digital format and our ability to get higher into accounts has increased with Zoom or with Teams or pick your, mm -hmm. I can, uh, and I've found um, consistently since COVID that I've been able to get higher more consistently inside of accounts. Um, so that's a, that's a, that's a positive. Mm -hmm. I think those relationships are thinner. 
So I think those relationships are thinner. So you have to work more at strengthening the bond of those relationships. And I think that is still an evolving set of uh, capabilities. I think we are, uh, from a pursuit perspective, from a sales pursuit perspective, I think we're still uh, well behind on um, taking full advantage of what being digital. We, we got a ton of capacity in the pre-sales function. And even when I go to some sessions or when I've gone to digital sessions, I still think we are learning how to, how to truly engage digitally and make it really interactive and making it as fruitful as it could be in this digital format. So there are, there are advantages to being digital that we're still figuring out how to take um, full advantage of. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the pendulum swinging back. I'm doing my first international trip in a couple of weeks. Um, hey, where are you going? Uh, come, going to London. So oh, nice. uh, London for the week. And uh, so I'm looking forward to kind of, you know, stepping out and getting in front of clients um, more consistently in person. But I don't want to lose the advantage that being digital has presented to us at the same time and continue to refine our digital skills um, in that regard. When you look back, um, and again, for our listeners, a lot of our listeners tell us that what they love most about these series is getting to know the human being behind the title. So um, when you think about moments in your career, many guests have said there's been one or two pivotal moments. What have those been for you personally? Well, um, you know, I think uh, going all the way back to my SAP the very beginning of my SAP career, I was at JD Edwards and Oracle prior to that. And all of those were really very, very interesting. But I think uh, when I, I carried a bag, that was my first, my first mm -hmm. um, uh, job at SAP, carrying a bag on the front lines. When I really saw SAP's approach to value and client um, value creation, and I kind of saw, I, I had the opportunity to see when I was at JD Edwards positioning an opportunity and, you know, oh, let me check in the SAP won that deal. What did SAP do in that opportunity? And, you know, it was multiples of what I was positioning. So it wasn't about cost. It was about value and being better able to articulate the impact that you could have in value. So that was really eye-opening mm. to me around the importance of high quality business cases, understanding the client's strategy, the business capabilities they needed in order to support that strategy, and then the technical underpinnings that supported those business capabilities. And um, putting that into a, what I would say, an Excel defensible storyline, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, around that made the opportunity to, you know, produce uh, amazing outcomes mm -hmm. for clients and then get fair return. So that was a, that for me was, uh, was, was a pretty big mind shift. And then at RMS, another one, when, when you are, an RMS was a, they produced natural catastrophe um, software and models for the insurance industry for pricing losses and uh, accumulated losses and the damage that can come from all different kinds of natural catastrophes. And um, what was really interesting to me was when you're verticalized and you're really verticalized, the depth that you actually mm -hmm. go to. And so, you know, and the, the insights and then the alignment that you have with the clients So that, you know, RMS, this very small company had these very high level relationships, CEO level relationships with um, insurers and brokers and reinsurers around the world because of the importance of the capabilities they provided. And so that to me was uh, when you fill a market need and you do it better than anybody else in the world, clients have time and give you access because that partnership and that collaborative and um, I guess I would say virtuous cycle is there for them to invest uh, ongoing. And so those those two things, you know, one very, very long time ago, 15, I guess 18 mm -hmm. years ago, and then uh, one very recent around verticalization have kind of continued to inform my thinking about um, our go-to-market models and how we approach clients. It's so interesting. As you were, the second one, as you were describing it, it took me back to um, planning conversations I've had over the years where um, you look at salespeople's territories and maybe they've got 25 or 50 accounts and you make the decision as a business maybe to go to 10 accounts. And the knee-jerk reaction of the salesperson is to be, oh my gosh, are you taking 15 counts away? How am I possibly going to hit my number? But then the more focused you are as a salesperson, suddenly you're forced to go and learn more about those customers and, and the people at those customers. And just, um, I, I think that the hyper-focus nature of what you've done with some of the sales organizations that you've worked at has truly let those salespeople um, be the best version of themselves, right? To genuinely 
understand where the opportunity is. Um, yeah. and, and, and are you finding that a little bit of precisely too in terms of how you do an account coverage? Yeah, we have, we have definitely expanded our verticalization. I, yeah. I, I think it's very, tough. it's very tough to go into a CPG account and then go into an auto and then go, mm. into, and then go into chemicals and then go into retail um, and have you know, meaningful conversations. I, I think you can cross industries if you're in the value chain. Meaning, mm, yeah, if you're in if you're in agriculture. If you're at you know you're in ag, and then you're talking to CPG. Like there's a value chain conversation, so you can, as an account executive, talk about the value chain and, and make some synergies there. But when you talk about really distinct, separate, you know, from punching metal to uh, mining for natural resources to retail or consumer packaged goods, there's a, there's a a big uh, differentiation in those business processes. Mm-hmm. Um, no client wants a generalist as their account executive. They don't. There you okay. go. Oh yeah, sign me up for the guy who doesn't know anything about my business. Um, yeah. they want somebody who actually understands their businesses, their business pains, can introduce them to others that are in their industry. You know, can can walk that person down the street um, and you know think that that concept and idea um, that I learned so well at SAP is really um, getting expanded on at. Uh, mm-hmm. Can continue to increase our verticalization and making sure that our messaging is very relevant and our understanding of those business pains and those business problems that we can scale that, you know, that we can solve yeah. a problem not for one client, but we can solve a problem for an industry. Your LinkedIn profile, and I quote, it says, as a former practitioner turned technology enthusiast, I love finding new ways to extend the customer's competitive advantage from funding its strategic objectives to leverage speed and efficiency to outpace rivals. So as a practitioner, were you, before you did, you're in a sales role and carrying a bag, what were you doing? I worked for PepsiCo uh, and for most of that time for Frito-Lay. I started there unloading trucks in college. Uh, and then uh, somebody said this, you know, like I, I had some common sense. And they said, okay, well, let's, you know, have this guy run a warehouse. And then I ran a fleet operations and then I ran a bunch of warehouses, the supply chain and supply chain design and um, building physical buildings and mm-hmm. managing distribution for them uh, and worked on a bunch of different projects, uh, mostly in North America, some in Mexico and um, decided to do a career. When I was going to move to Dallas, decided to do a career change and um, ended up at uh, J.D. Edwards as an industry principal for consumer packaged goods. So I was wow. kind of in that industry verticalization focus uh, all the way back in 98, focused on CPG, wanted to get my hands on the software, then I wanted to pre-sales and then mm-hmm. to supply chain software sales and kind of progressed from there. But yeah, came from a completely different um, industry background. Into yeah. Yeah. And I also love this. I've got your LinkedIn profile right here. It says, personally, I love to outpace rivals on the racetrack. You'll yeah. find me trying to eke out a few tenths of a second on tracks across the Midwest on most weekends. Yes. So has that always been a passion? It has always been a passion. Uh, a passion as a spectator for a long time. And then uh, about four years ago as a competitor. And uh, it's been really good for me to kind of understand, you know, like, I, 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 there are real life lessons there. You know, you don't, you don't win. Uh, races just because you took you took uh, one corner fast you don't pick up four seconds in a corner you pick up tenths and it's just consistency and it's just picking up a little bit and a little bit and a little bit and the consistency mm-hmm. and a lot of it is doing the same thing over and over again I, I, I'm, I do road racing and so it's you know the same thing over and over and over again but just a little bit better a little bit better a little bit better and a little bit better and better than the competition and you outpace uh, the competition and um, there's always the trade-off of, you know, the investments in performance or the investments in the driver skill. So do you invest in the car or the driver, invest in the driver mm-hmm. it's off much, much better. So like, that's part of what we talk about when we talk about empire core enablement of the teams, it's investing in the driver um, pays the biggest, the biggest single dividends. So, wow. I like the segue back to empire. Appreciate that. So, um, so <laughs> let's talk, let's talk leadership. Let's t- uh, switch gears a little bit. So, so many people, I'm not just saying this part, but so many people spoke, speak so highly of you and your, your leadership style. So how do you describe your leadership style? And, and why is it that so many people just enjoy working for you so much? Uh, compassionate dictatorship. 
I, I feel like uh, my, my job has always been to um, make the front line as successful as possible. Hmm. So uh, that is what my job is today. Uh, that has always been as soon as I moved into leadership is to make the front line as successful as possible. It's very difficult jobs. They're um, very complex. They are, there are a lot of demands from multiple different sources and they're more, most consistently touching the customers, which I care about intimately. And so I want the customers to have a great experience through that. So am I enabling and empowering and supporting the frontline teams to help the customers understand our value proposition and differentiate? And so that has been the basis of what I've viewed my uh, leadership to be. Um, so that's that's one. It's like, you know, the frontline mm-hmm. matter, matter and then enabling everybody that uh, uh, supports them to deliver. And then I would say I, uh, I am a pretty demanding leader, but I value progress over perfection. You know, and so I think about just let's just make progress. Like we don't have to be perfect tomorrow, but let's make progress. And when we make mistakes, you know, the number one thing is did we learn from that mistake and that opportunity? And will we react differently going forward? And that's not about placing blame or, you know, uh, it is about if we, if we learn from that opportunity, then it was worth it. Um, and let's continue to continue to move forward. And then I would say the, the last thing is that I commit to everybody is that I will make material investments in uh, our people, you know? And so I say, I view this profession um, as being very difficult and very challenging and you have to continuously refine your capabilities. And I will give opportunities, whether it's executive presence or negotiation skills or presentation or um, just product understanding, or if you wanna go learn about, you know, Things that are important to your clients, international trade. Like if you're if you're doing X, Y, you know, how invest in people to help them become better resources and better capable um, in front of the in front of the clients. And if they and I, hopefully everybody takes advantage of that. And so it's this continuous learning um, environment with with rising expectations. Like it is not yeah. you know, with rising expectations. And my hope is that we create this sales culture um, where people would will get recruited. Um, to go other places, but that they will stay with precisely and they'll stay with our organization because they get support and they get concern and, and care for their success as individuals that they won't find in other, in other places. So yeah, very long answer to your question. But that's kind of how I think about what my, my leadership requires. Um, and there's a whole other aspect to I mentioned the CRO, like making sure we make smart decisions, that there's money to do the kinds of things that we want to do, that if we do an acquisition, that we've gone into it with our eyes wide open, that we know how we're going to execute and bringing those things together. And so there's a whole bunch of other things that have to happen, right? But mm-hmm. things right allowed me to stay focused on those teams that are servicing and touching the clients and ensuring that they are educated and enabled and empowered to do um, their jobs you know, uh, very, very well. So it makes perfect sense. There's a lot of people who join or listen to these calls. So maybe first time leaders or earlier on in their leadership um, careers. Has your leadership style changed? Because you've been a leader for a while. Has it changed or developed over time? Um, I think it's, it, I mean, it's, it has certainly evolved uh, a bit. I guess I would say it is kind of, it's, it, I've become more aware of certain things like growth mindset. You yeah. know, like, hey, yeah. I would say I've had a growth mindset for a very, I would say I, I haven't always had a growth mindset, but I, for a very long time, I have had a growth mindset. And so I recognize in the team when that doesn't exist and, you know, what I need to do to express what's possible um, with that. I think the more experiences I'm still learning every day and the more experiences I get, it does inform my leadership style about the challenges or the issues or the opportunities that sit in front of us. Um, and so um, yes, it's constantly evolving, but I think my my core tenants have been what I've been working with for uh, for some, for some time. Yeah, yeah right. And, and um, because of the roles that you've had, I want to talk about, and it's not a new topic, but sales and marketing alignment. It's been a topic that has been discussed um, ad nauseum, but I still want to talk about it here because I think you've got quite an interesting view on it. What's your take on this? Um, well, I mean, I, I think sales and marketing, it's, you know, it's, it's critical uh, from an alignment uh, perspective. And I don't, I hate like the finger pointing that goes on, you know, so mm-hmm. I'm, 
not, you know, that's certainly not the situation I'm involved in now, but sometimes I see the, the finger pointing that goes, goes along. I think if marketing isn't, uh, marketing needs to be listening to sales, sales needs to be listening to marketing and marketing and sales need to be working together to uh, best execute and prosecute things. And if that can't happen, then there's, you know, foundationally something wrong. And I think there, if you have disagreements between sales and marketing, you, you need to figure that out uh, as quickly mm-hmm. as possible because it, it will, from a motivation perspective, from an execution, from a performance perspective, it can destroy kind of what that pipeline looks like from the brand awareness, uh, the client marketing aspects of it. It's, you know, those things cannot be out of sync. So um, some CROs have uh, uh, CMOs that work for them. I have a CMO partner, which I'm perfectly happy with, but we're fully aligned. We have a common set of metrics of what we look at and how we manage and execute the, the business. We both have budgets and we execute and contribute our budgets towards those common uh, those common goals. And so it truly is a partnership, um, but we run, we run it really, really clearly. Like we have a really clear cadence that we use to manage and operate the business around, you know, leads, um, mm-hmm. lead conversion, pipeline management from the top of the funnel through the bottom of the funnel. And so there's no shadow pipelines. There's no shadow contribution that's being tracked or managed. It's really clearly we use one set of metrics to talk about the business. And we talk about the business regularly um, so that there are no surprises. Right. So, yeah. I think there's a whole whole series of conversations we could do just on that topic, uh, topic alone. But um, I think a lot of people listening to this who perhaps don't know you, Pat, uh, would be thinking, how does this guy just say, stay so even keeled with so much responsibility? So I've got to ask you, how do you stay balanced with such a, a big job and all this responsibility? What's the secret? Um, I mean, I th- uh, so one is experience. So I think when you, mm-hmm. Uh, when you get to see a lot of things, you know, I, I've seen a lot of really good things. I've seen a lot of bad things happen. And so, um, and when, in bad things that you turn into good things, like when deals go into the ditch or when, you know, m- maybe have real, real marketing challenges or real pipeline challenges, you know, the experience allows you to say like, there's a way through this. I think my growth, a growth mindset, my growth mindset allows me to believe that human beings are capable of amazing things. Everybody is capable of amazing things. And so even when, you know, things aren't headed in the right direction that we as human beings have, you know, a virtually unlimited capacity to change and, and really kind of get our arms around small and large challenges and change the direction or change the course of things. Um, certainly in my account executive days, uh, I probably, my ups and downs and my swings were a little more dramatic uh, than they are today. And, and, you know, maybe through that, I also learned, you know, kind of uh, the better balance, to better balance, you know, balance those things. So yeah. I, do, I do get emotional um, and I, I do get angry or I will get upset about things. Um, but, you know, there's a, there's no good. In, well, I should say, sometimes you gotta throw some bats, my friend. Uh, right, uh, right, right. Sometimes you gotta throw some bats. Um, but uh, in, in many cases, it's the, you know, thoughtful approach to progress and making progress. And when bad things happen to make progress, that's the best approach for rallying everybody. So I'm sure there have been some pretty influential people um, throughout your career. What's the best leadership advice that you've ever received? Um, that I've ever, yeah, that I've ever mm. received. Well, I mean, I th- I'll, give, I'll share some leadership advice, you know, so... Uh, somebody once told me, uh, bad news doesn't get better with age. So I'm, I'm very transparent about what's going on in the business. You know, like I think sometimes as a, as a former frontline sales person, you want to manage the message. And, um, no, I, I really, I am very transparent about the business today. And so with everybody, uh, and how I run the business, it's very transparent up and down. I mean, I talk about, the overall forecast with the entire team, how we're how well we're doing from a PL perspective. I share all of all of that information, good good or bad. So the transparency, I think, is really good for the team uh, team understanding um, understanding that. Um, I think maybe to the to the second point that you made, it's not plasma. Mm. You know, what we're doing is different. It's not we're not delivering plasma. Um, Portions of our business are mission critical. So portions of the things that we do are mission critical, but in general, the majority of what we do. And so it's kind of having this pragmatic approach, intense, focused, 
you know, success oriented, but this pragmatic approach uh, to, to what we do on a day in day out, day out basis, I think is also helpful to create the kind of culture that we want. Um, that we mm -hmm. want. So. so you're clearly, you're clearly laser focused. What, what, what drives you? What, what has made you this, this person that you are? Um, I, th I, I came from a uh, pretty humble upbringing. I'm, I'm pretty shocked. You know, when I was uh, my first job, in my first job at Frito Lay, um, you know, they were they were paying me my age, so mm -hmm. I was salary was my age, and then at one point I got to twice my age, and I said, "This is the most amazing, you know, I'm making twice my age. This is the most amazing job mm -hmm. I've ever had. I mean, more than my dad at that point in time, you know. I, this is the most amazing job that I've ever had, and so I had this uh, amazing, I have this incredible respect." For the opportunity that we have in front of us, I think technology sales in particular is incredible. Uh, I think the thing that we do for the things that we do for our clients are pretty amazing, like enabling their businesses and driving um, pretty incredible outcomes. You know, I've seen clients produce business cases where the software was going to generate, you know, a billion dollars of savings for them. That's that, that's unbelievable. Like that's an unbelievable that I get to be part of driving those kinds of opportunities. And so I have this really immense respect for what technology can enable uh, for our clients. And uh, I feel like a big, I feel there's a massive obligation for us to take advantage of that. And, um, you know, I never imagined when I was 21 years old to have these kinds of opportunities. And I'm glad that I, I still haven't forgotten that. And I still feel mm -hmm. this incredible obligation to, you know, don't forget that this is an amazing industry with an amazing opportunity with incredible clients that we get to help so beautiful and um we've heard all the the positive there's got to be things that frustrate you and, and you mentioned one of them right bad news not getting to you soon enough from a business perspective so you can pivot accordingly what other things frustrate you either about business about life about people generally <laughs> <laughs> um i mean i think the counterpoint to what i just said is when people don't uh when i think people phone it in if somebody's phoning yeah. me in kinds of opportunities yeah. or uh, so that's one. I, I do think um, people that have, have a fixed mindset is pretty can be pretty frustrating. I think they were really mm -hmm. challenged with COVID, and that they you know that they and I I, I have empathy for them. Um, I, I can certainly our sympathy. I should better I say I have sympathy for them. Uh, but I think that the um, people with a fixed mindset are you know are really 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 do frustrate me because I think. Mm -hmm. It, slop, it stops or slows a business from its true potential. And I, I feel to a certain extent that person or that individual is also stopped from their, for yeah. their full potential. So if you, you know, Carol, Carol Dweck's book about growth mindset or grit or, you know, most of what Simon Sinek writes about, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I really do believe in, you know, people, we as human beings have this incredible potential and I get very frustrated when I see people that, don't want to take advantage of what their potential really can be. Yeah, we, we talk a lot and, and we're so aligned because I'm obviously doing what we do. Um, it's all about getting people to step out of their comfort zone to realize their, their full potential. And yeah. despite showing them the path and giving them the tools, some people are just not prepared to, to take that leap for a multitude of different reasons. And I, I get it. It's, it's, it's frustrating. You know? Yeah, I talk about and, and so, I mean, sometimes you have to force yeah. Some actions on that. And I saw so a lot of times um, I talk about, hey, stress uh, is sometimes viewed as a negative, but stress is a positive. Stress is a outside influence that causes people to change. It also makes diamonds like stress and pressure mm -hmm. are what make diamonds. And so I think, think people can really discover who they really are and what they are, what they are truly um, capable of. I, I can remember you know, it's not a stressor, but I had, I had, a, I had someone that was, that was uh, underperforming and we, we didn't, we were on our path to a, you know, performance improvement plan, a really formal conversation. Um, I had some really frank conversations with the individual at the beginning of his second year uh, working with me. And at the end of the year, his W2 was the largest he'd ever earned in his career. And mm -hmm. then it was larger again, you know, and so it was this, total change of his perspective on what he was capable of. I don't, it wasn't other things, but it was his perspective on what he was capable of um, that materially changed and, you know, became life-changing 
opportunity for him. And he's still continuing down that path today. He's a top, you know, consistent top uh, performer because he finally recognized that, um, you know, there was more that he was capable of and he took mm. advantage of it. So, so good. So good. All right. So before we let you go, we do have a quick fire round. So lots of fun questions. Um, are you up for this? Should we give it a go? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> All right. Some of the questions might be one word answers. Some of them I might push a little harder on based on your answer, but let's, let's give it a go. Question number one. Who is your hero? Uh, my dad. Okay. Best sales leader you've ever partnered with? Uh, Steve Shute. Can you tell us why? Uh, I think it's just his, uh, well, one, he was fun to work with. Two, really, really knowledgeable about clients and client interactions and client strategies uh, around that. And then three, just, you know, a um, all-encompassing kind of leader, you know, kind of thinking about the individual, the company, like kind of really a good 360 degree view of people and companies and prospects and clients. So yeah, just a really good, really good guy. Learned, I worked for him for a short amount of time. It was a really good department. Are you a morning lark or are you a night owl? I have a global role, so I am both. <laughs> Which, what do you prefer? Uh, I, I'm, I'm an early riser, naturally. Yeah. yeah. Um, Halloween, last Halloween costume? Oh, um, there was this uh, character on uh, Sesame Street that uh, well, I, I can't, I, I, I forgot that I, it was a, a Sesame Street character that was basically uh, two googly eyes and this big mouth. And uh, the name is, <laughs> his name, it was a homemade, it was a homemade costume. Uh, name is taking right now. Do, do pictures exist? Uh, yes, they do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Moving on down, moving on. Um, favorite city in the world? Which one? Uh, Barcelona. Okay. And yeah. any city or country that you haven't visited that you'd most want to visit? Russia. Ooh. How many cups of coffee a day? Uh, about eight. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow. All right. And then, <laughs> wow. Uh, and what would you, final question, what would you tell your younger self? Uh, do it. Go on. I've got to, I'll be, you got, I'm going to push you on that. You know, I think uh, there was a, you know, when the door opens, go through it. So just do it. Continue to take advantage of opportunities as they present themselves, you know, to you. So continue to just do it. So, I'm ready. Yeah. Good stuff. Pat, thank you so much for joining us. I, I really appreciate it.